the dangers of dental practice ownership. This is Paul, Dr. Nacho Goodman with my good friend, Dr. Mark Costas, who is one of the most positive people in our dentisting space. So why are we going to start out on such a negative tone? Uh, <laughs> but it's important to prevent disaster, prevent nightmares. So the theme of what we're going to talk about today or what are some of the dangers of dental practice ownership, especially multiple practice ownership? But Mark, you've been on many times, but I always say, you know, run around your dental office, which room you go in, am I doing a night guard here? It can be chaotic. So, you know, we're out here in the social media space, even though you've been here on so many times, orient our audience just for a minute as to who you are and what you do to help dentists live their best lives. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Paul. Uh, it's always great chatting with you and your audience. You have such a positive audience, which <laughs> To me is a very very refreshing because there's a lot of there's a lot of social yeah. media that's super negative out there not just for dentistry but just in general yeah you know you put something out and it's like holy cow I never even thought that somebody could be offended or angry about like the most positive message that I could have thought of for the day and that's I want to interject sorry I would say I, I I don't interrupt I just interject with good ideas that's why I tell my wife Mark but <laughs> you just saw our golden doodle and you're so right because I thought it was tough to run dental nachos we're on a golden doodle group. That can be brutal. The people, really? the way people are, yeah. So even a doodle group. So you're very right. Social media in general can be frustratingly negative. So I appreciate you kind of giving us a, a high five on our positivity. For sure, for sure. It's the it's the one thing that I just love. It's that's what's so attractive. I think that's why your audience has grown so much because there's so few places to get that in the world today. Uh, but just a little bit about me. I've owned 16 dental practices, which. So uh, the the topic intrigues me, the dangers of multiple practice ownership, because there's lots of dangers, lots of pitfalls. Yeah. I just sold my last four practices uh, three weeks ago. So I am congratulations retired. Thank you. Uh -huh. From from that uh, part of my life, I also own um, a company called Dental Success Institute, which is a, a coaching and consulting business uh, for dentists to, to help them, uh, you know, reach their full potential. I also own or was co-founder of the Dental Success Network, which is about 1,200 positive uh, thinking dentists yeah. just like you, Paul, and you're, you're part of that awesome community. And I have a podcast called the Dentalpreneur Podcast. Uh, you're doing so great. many good things. And you guys, I'm so proud to be a collaborator and have you guys support us as a sponsor with the Dental Success Network. People can text DSN to 215-543-6454 to get the uh, best deal possible in this. I want to actually, you know, I, I go in a lot of different directions, Mark, but you said something that inspired yeah. me. Congratulations on retiring from practice parenting. Now you can be a practice grandparent, right? It doesn't matter what happened. You know, you can give the practice back at the end of the day. Exactly. So I, I, uh, exactly. But I know I connected you with Dr. Lincoln Harris recently, someone I admire yeah. like you. And I always ask people who, Lincoln Harris always says, no one sees your journey, right? They think, oh, this person just woke up one day and they were successful. And one of the things he always says, he wish he got coaching sooner. And, you know, what Jeff and I are part of your Dental Success Institute, it's so amazing, the DSN. You know, could you just talk to our audience for a minute about why reaching out for help in any capacity, but especially as a dental practice owner is so important with either A, your personal journey or people that you talk to every day? Yeah, it's a it's a really good and valid question. I think that a lot of people we are kind of raised in dentistry to be individuals and to kind of hold our cards close to vest. You know, you get a test in you know right. in undergrad, and you're like, yeah. oh, I can't share this test with anybody else because they grade on a curve, and there's only you know four A's that are going to be given out out of a hundred people in the right. class. So you know, and then we get out into into dental school, and we kind of we carry that individualistic and just kind of all out for myself personality right. it's it's kind of it's kind of a survival mechanism and i understand it um so you know from undergrad to, to dental school that kind of goes through that way and then we graduate and then we are thrust into you know the the real world and there's so many questions that we don't know how to answer but we're afraid to ask people because our peers right. now become not our dental uh, classmates now they are the other dentists that are you know really right. our competitors in in our towns so we're friends with them and we do study clubs together maybe we do ce together but the, the natural the natural kind of deep down um a propensity is to not share right yeah. or, or share our best things um so it's, it's very difficult to get an objective supporter out there that understands what it feels like to wear all these hats to wear the management right. hat the entrepreneurial hat take all the risk and then still be a perfect clinician Right. And be a great dad when you get home and a great spouse. So it's very, very difficult to find people that can support you and understand exactly what you're going through. It's hard. Uh, and so I, we're, I, we're, we're an island in dentistry that way. I, yeah. I love us talking with um, uh, Cornelius is, and it was actually after you gave a great opening to one of the uh, dental success summits about the island. And he said, you know, Mark, 
I actually was called more of a cave than an island. And he was right. I mean, it's like, you know, an island kind of thinks someone could fly by and see you, but dentistry is more of a cave. No one ever usually goes to one, two, three Nacho street and says, how are you doing inside of this cave? And it's, it, it's so tough. And I was actually talking with the great Dr. Amanda C who I like very much. You should connect with her and uh, kind of a dentist job connect thing. She, you know, she hired a coach who's like, Amanda, you need an associate. She's like, I don't need an associate. Like Amanda, you're, you're speaking, you're a mom, you're lecturing, you deserve an associate. And it took yeah. someone outside of her box to be like, you're right. I do deserve this. And I think, you know, you deserve coaching. You deserve someone who can help you. And um, it's a sh sad to me that dental school doesn't talk more about this. I mean, it's kind of that chicken, the egg thing. It's why they, they create the problem. So I can't expect them to solve the problem they've created, like the Einstein thing. But I think yeah. that deserve level is so key. It's so true. It's so true. And, and you know, just to, just to get the perspective of somebody that's actually experienced what you're going through, or right. maybe several times, or a community of people that have you know, seen just about everything. I, I always say that like our, our coaching group is so different because we, we really, really have a collaborative kind of uh, mechanism. So if somebody has a question, they post it to our 205 people in the group. They don't post it. They don't just email me directly because yeah. I've had 16 practices is actually very small sample size, but you get 200 people that are, their main mission is to support one another. And you're going to get you know, the best answer that you could possibly. I love get. that. And I love party group. I mean, I love going on the app myself. And I, I was kind of doing some messaging because I want to be responsible for what I've created, Mark. And it's like, if you have diabetes, you can't go to Planet Fitness and be like, hey, I'm going to solve my diabetes by going on the elliptical. It's like, no, you need a doctor to help mm -hmm. you. The elliptical will be part of it. And even my own free Facebook group, there's limitations to that. The safety of posting online, the question, the the responses you get back. So inside of your amazing community, you're getting people like Dr. Jason Tenori when he's not doing pull-ups on a volcano. I, that's like every other day. But you're getting someone. He went to dental school with me. You're getting these amazing people, the Dr. Ardra Wards, the Dr. Andrew Ballows, the, the Dr. Christian Mullins at all ages and stages saying, hey, this is happening to me too. I totally get it. And I compliment you on there's no hater aid. There's no toxicity there. I mean, friction is normal, right? Friction is yeah. like, I mean, people argue about the end of that Eagles game. We can't spend the whole time doing that this time. So friction is normal, but toxicity is not. So I really truly appreciate you guys creating that for practice owners and associates to be, to learn more about it. Let's just shift to multiple practice ownership. And I think it's something you can talk about in a really genuine way. People start or buy a practice. They do well, Mark. This is, I was one of these people and you were one of these people and they think, I should just buy a second one. That will solve my problems. I will make millions of dollars. And in a very JBR, just be real, I got a call from, I messaged someone who's struggling with their second practice. It's not profitable. They really might want to sell it for a loss. So just talk to our audience for a second about the dangers of multi-practice ownership from your perspective. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, you have to be very, very clear about why you want to have multiple practices. I've seen many, many small uh, to mid-sized regional groups that expanded for the sake of expanding, and one or two larger practices probably would have been much more profitable. So you have to be clear as far as why you're doing it. And if it's for an ultimate exit at some point, you have to be very clear about what needs to happen in order for this thing to be sellable. Yeah. But I'll, I'll tell you, there's two different scenarios, right? So the first scenario is what I experienced. I, I uh, bought my first practice. It did very, very well. We went from like 300,000 uh, in the first year to I think 1.3 in a 12-month awesome. period of time. It was an acquisition. And so, of course, naturally, I'm thinking, wow, I, I got this practice thing down pat. Yeah. I'm going to do it again. And I did it again and again. So in the first year and a half, I had three dental practices that I purchased. They were all thriving. They're all doing really well. And I mistakenly believed that I was God's gift to entrepreneurship. What I didn't realize at the time was that I was very, very fortunate in that I had really good associates yeah. and I, I, I just lucked into them and I had really, really good office managers. Once again, just lucked into them. Yeah. But as things happen, as time goes on, I started losing those key players, those, those level 10 people, and I did not know how to replace them, and I did not know what they were doing to make themselves so good. So those three practices um, were my foundation and my justification for buying four, five, six, on up to 10. Yeah. And we struggled for a long time because those three practices didn't really teach me anything because they are getting run by a great group of people that had nothing to do with my leadership, right? 
Yeah. And so you have to make sure that you truly understand and you're a sophisticated business owner. You understand how a dollar flows through your practice. You understand how to lead people. You understand how, you know, how HR works and um, how profitability works. You have to understand how to read financial, uh, yeah. you know, uh, reports, et cetera. All of that stuff needs to happen, not just, uh, you know, monetary success in a practice, in a smooth running kind of operation, you have to understand what's happening in each of your departments and realize that if you just have level 10 people in there and you you stumbled across them, luckily, that doesn't make you a good business owner. That makes it's you- a, a, I mean, there's so much owner. value to unpack there because you. I always say, you know, life is about uh, good timing, which is another word for luck, right? And sometimes, Dennis, I appreciate your authenticity people don't always acknowledge sometimes this flat out really good luck being in the right place at the right time. And of course you put yourself in it and you're there, but it shows the vulnerability that when you don't have the level 10 people, just like we see when sports teams, quarterbacks uh, go down, they can't, op they can't operate that way. And maybe, you know, I've loved this conversation and I have a second practice. And if someone's like, I have a second location, you know, but Jeff and I technically have, you know, probably four practices we require, but we have two locations. And if someone said to me, Hey, Paul, are you glad you bought your second location 13 years in? You know what I say, Mark? I don't know. Can't return it, but I'm not sure. Yeah. If I went back to that moment and they said you could choose again, I don't know. Now, the benefits, I've helped associates grow. We now have a hygiene center. But the stuff that's kept me up at night is the cash flow of that practice because it's not my owner operator practice. If someone's nice. just popping by listening, what is the keep yourself up at night financial part of a second location? Because there's expenses no matter what in those locations. So maybe kind of talk about that for a minute. Yeah, I had a broker friend uh, that was that said something very wise and, you know, uh, good brokers are few and far between, as you know, yeah. Paul, because it, it's very, very easy to get into the field yes. uh, with very little qualifications. So a lot of people chase the money and they become brokers and they don't really have the skill set or the knowledge to be good at it. But I had a, a broker friend that said, uh, just something very simple. He said, it's really easy to acquire or start them. It's really difficult to unwind yourself. From yeah. Them. Terrible it's return. Difficult. I would say it's a terrible return policy, right? It's a terrible you know, return. Yeah. It's like you zero know. return policy, right? So uh, you have to yeah. think about, you have to think about the, the obligation that you're signing up for, not just a note, but also usually a 10 year lease. And those 10 year leases are nearly impossible to get out of without hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars right. in, in damages or, you know, or, or just uh, lost, lost income. So the financial, the financial risks that you're taking when you go to multiples is, is astronomical. I mean, it can sink you very, very quickly. And I've, I've had many, many sleepless nights when three of my practices were killing it, but they were supporting the four dogs at the time. Right. So yeah, we're still losing money um, on the seven practice operation that from the outside looks great because you know the parking lot is always full, but maybe I didn't negotiate a lease correctly right. in this particular location. Maybe the demographic research that I did was inaccurate. Maybe uh, I lost a, a big industry uh, for some reason in that particular town. There's so many different things that are variable and unpredictable in multiple practice ownership, you have to really have a war chest of capital that's ready to deploy if you're going to get into this game because it's very, yeah. very risky. Not that not that it can't be, you know, successfully uh, you know, executed. I've seen a lot of people, I mean, I, I'm surrounded every day with people that have executed it beautifully, but people just need to go in with their eyes wide open. And I think that unless you get that that what we call black belt flagship practice, a yeah. perfect practice that you can replicate over and over again. Um, as far as like the systems and, you know, the, the, the revenue model and all of that stuff, unless you have a perfect franchise prototype, I wouldn't go to number two. I love that. That's, that's such great value. Pull that out. Not your team for us, because now let's just sort of, I come to the Dent dental success summit one of my favorite weekends of the year. I've had the awesome opportunity to speak and sponsor dental students just have a great time. And you bring these people on stage, which I love showcase their success. You know, I was thinking of Dr. Aaron Wilson, who's great. Uh, Dr. Aaron's husband met Jeff out in Texas at a fitness thing recently. Yeah, that was crazy. That was yeah. a great, great, great story there. And yeah. Help. Now someone's like, okay, Paul, Mark, we got it. I'm not going to sign up for a second practice tomorrow. Now I'm going to turn my attention back to my one practice. Mm -hmm. You know, what does the DSN do? And tell us more about this black beltification, what you're striving to get and what you and the coaches and the community do to bring these people 
to a place where they can be proud of their practice, the people that work there and their profitability? Yeah, that, that's that's a very, very good question. I um, uh, I created this belt system because what I realized about five years into my consulting company was that I was creating little mini marks. Like I was creating what I what nearly drove me away from the profession six years yeah. in, right? So I was a hard charging guy. I owned six practices at the time, um, making uh, very, very good money. But um, I was not a happy person. Like I was, I was grinding myself to a nub. I was working yeah. eighty-hour work weeks. There was no balance in my life. Um, and frankly, the the reason that the practices were doing well was because I was I was a micromanager. I was, I had my hands in everything. There's no organizational chart. There's no right. nothing. It was like everything flowed through me. So that was a very, and very I want to add something, Marco, as you life. tell me about this, but you made me think of something. And I yeah. said this to my dad growing up with the most amazing dad. And, you know, he did used to say work 32 hours a week. And I was like, dad, you do do like payroll after hours. That's real work. But maybe at the end of the day, you work 40 hours a week. And my yeah. friend's dad was an attorney and they made more money than my dad. And I wasn't jealous, but I was just like, can you believe my, you know, that and my dad was not a jealous guy, but he goes, do you know, he works like 90 hours a week. That's two jobs, right? So when someone says I make $500,000 a year working 80 hours a week, they make 250 a year at two jobs, no Great. judgment, just an observation yeah. of the life you're going to win. So someone says I make $782,000 a year, but I work 90 hours a week. That is two jobs. So I think it's important that people identify the requirements of effort. So you kind of said, this is too much time. You know, I, you know what I think the toughest part of making the mini marks were, Mark, was uh, all the bicep curls everyone had to do each day, right? <laughs> I thought that was, uh, but I just, in a funny way, you're saying, I need to make a shift because I'm creating too many mini marks. My own work-life balance is out of whack. So I'll let you catch us back up there. Yeah. So we we created this thing. We created the four futures, which is mind, meeting, muscle, and money, where we track things outside of, of our professional hat, right? So that's one thing that we did uh, within our coaching group, which makes us very unique because very few coaching groups, you know, focus on, you know, um, meaning, which is our purpose for being on the planet, like our personal and work relationships, um, our fitness and uh, uh, vibrancy and energy yeah. level, and then money. You, 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 you master all the other things, the money will come. But we do also take, uh, a very strong um, priority to making things that are very subjective, objective. So like, yeah. it's very difficult to put a number on leadership or like a number on culture within your yeah. practice or even a number on systemization. Those are very kind of subjective things, but we've, we've, we dove deep into trying to figure out assessments and ways to track somebody's leadership score and somebody's culture score within their dental practice per employee and overall practice. Yeah. How systemized are you? And then of course we have profitability and overhead. So if you take four numbers, leadership, culture, systemization, and profitability, we have a belt system. You can be a white belt, blue belt, brown belt, or black belt. Everybody within our yeah. organization strives to become a black belt, which is 80% or higher in all the assessments and an overhead of 50% or lower, which is an EBITDA of 20% or greater. So that's what we're shooting for to get to this coveted black belt status. And then they also have to master their four futures as well. So within you know Dental Success Network, we have 20 plus chat rooms, everything from practice management to you know uh, real-time treatment to that's awesome. uh, IV sedation, everything that you can think of when it comes to being a dentist or owning a dental practice. And we have people that are moderating those chat rooms and, and keeping the conversations going in real time. And then we also have a very, very robust continuing education library, yeah. over 300 hours of continuing education when it comes to clinical or practice management. And then we have the biggest buying group in the world. So, yeah, I mean, you, it, it's too good. Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking, I was writing down, you know, I was sharing on my group I, and you, you've created this opportunity for people to taste test this community without investing tens of thousands of dollars in coaching at the time of this recording, what is the monthly cost to be a member of the DSN? 199. Yeah. So, I mean, for what we should be, there's a lot of challenges in dentistry. I loved your opening speech about, uh, I loved how authentic we're about dental insurance and the, and the presence of DSOs, not that they're evil or heroic that how this is affecting our world. But what's amazing is dentists like, for $200 a month, $2,400 a year, you get access to these 
um, dental geniuses who are also just like you, which struggle with their family. Dr. Thad uh, Schroeder, he was just saying how it kind of saved him over the pandemic. And that's what I encourage people to do because, you know, you and I are kind of you know, people think, Mark, I, we just sprouted up from social media land back in 2017. I did have a life prior to dental nachos. Was, I'm not like a cabbage patch yeah. kid. It was like, here is. So I used to speak at uh, Penn. I'm a dentist now. What? And uh, I loved it. And, you know, this great, awesome female dental student would say, hey, Paul, um, can you speak to the Young Women's Dentist Society? And I go, I'm a 31-year-old man. And they go, you could try. And I said, no, you got to get a Dr. Audra Ward. And you got to get a Dr. Aaron Wolfson. Because- yeah. It's not about right or wrong or gender. It's just about that's a life path that you have to follow. And how do you be a mom and a practice owner at the same time? You know, and it goes for dads too. You know, dads own 10 practices, but still want to try to coach a sports team. Sometimes things give. So I think people being able to taste test this community in such a friendly and economical way, you've created something so good for us. Um, and we appreciate that. I want to kind of now switch a little back to the dangers. And you and I know this. So I recently, one of my best friends is a hedge fund. A partner, Mark, reminds of you, just great guy. And he works in distressed debt. And for like 20 years, I'm like, I got no idea what you do, right? And he's tried to explain it to me. I kind of now have an understanding, but I just talked to a DSO who is buying DSOs that are going out of business, right? So I said to my friend, Ooh. I was like, so basically one DSO is like, we think there's a risk to take a free throw, but we're now we're giving up. We're not giving any more money. Then another DSO standing at the three point line saying, we'll take a crack at it. So I was talking to this group and, you know, practices do go out of business, Mark. And as I kind of set you up to talk about this, one thing that frustrates me about Dennis is sometimes I will call their delusionally positive, right? So if I say, hey, one of my coaching clients just declared bankruptcy, they yell, not everybody declares bankruptcy, but that person did, right? So that doesn't help that person feel better. If you're broken down on the side of the road and people drive by and say, I just want to let you know I'm not broken down, that does make people feel worse. So I see startups, groups, practices struggle to a place where they actually go out of business. Are you seeing some of this in the space as well? Yeah, listen, th this is a great, great, great topic. And I love talking about this. I've talked to lots of um, DSO, you know, owners, uh, lots of bankers, um, that lots of underwriters that are responsible for approving these loans. And there is a myth out there, uh, Paul, that dental loans are super safe for, from a banking perspective. And I, I, I want to qualify that and everybody should know what they're talking about. For single practice owners, single yeah. doc practices, the default rate on dental loans uh, given to, uh, from banks to dentists is less than 1%. So it's yeah. one of the best bets in the world as far as lending out money. They have, we have nearly a perfect track record. But you go to two and three and four practices and that default rate significantly yeah. increases. So what happens with these single doctor practices? Does that mean that dentists are just remarkable entrepreneurs yeah. and we're just so smart. We get out of dental school and we just know how to run a million dollar operation. No, the thing is that we can struggle uh, from a business perspective, but the value of our skill set is so high that we're right. still bringing home enough money to, to say, I'm doing all right. I'm making $200,000, right? Yeah. What people don't realize that they're leaving on the table is that other 20 or 30% of profit that if they realize how to run a dental practice, that is something they can plug and play for the rest of their career. Right. But yes, in fact, there are many, many financial um, obstacles out there, uh, landmines, if you will, yeah. that if you don't know how to avoid them, then you're going to step on them and it's going to be painful. Um, so the fact that um, the default rate for dental loans is 1% is great, but that doesn't mean that we're all wildly successful. That just means that we're grinding it out and probably making less money than we should be money making uh, as far as the amount of risk and yeah. work that we're putting into it. 68 to 72% for the average overhead in the United States means that you, you add, you know, 30% uh, doctor compensation on top of that. Most practices in the United States are not profitable. And Mark, so, you know, I'll share this and we, we you, you guys have helped us as well. And I, you know, we have this multi-specialty model. It's a little unique. It's not that special, but I've never run just a straight solo practice, but I have a lot of clients and people did 
-hmm. you're buying a job sometimes and it's not that good of a job, right? So I'm just saying like, like you can work somewhere and make $300,000 a year and start at 8.30 and end at 5.30. At the end of the day, you're not asked to do anything else. And then when you're a practice owner, you're thinking about all the time. So it's just, an like you made such a good point. It's an eyes wide open approach because the bank has, will never call you. If you pay your banking loan, they will not call you and say, hey, Dr. Mark, are you making good money or not good money? They don't care. I mean, you make 150 or 350, they just want their 6,000 a month for 10 years. And they, that's how it should be. So banks aren't gonna bail you out. And I think it's such a key point that, you know, just talk a little bit more because my opinion is that, what is it when, when someone says, I have 68% overhead and I should be making more money. Unpack that a little for us. Yeah, so we we break it into buckets, right? So there's fixed and variable expense. So the first category that we look at is payroll, total payroll, and that includes payroll taxes, fringe benefits, and everything. That is a number. And then you have fixed and variable expenses, which is all of the cotton rolls that you buy. That's a variable yeah. expense. All the lab fees, that's a variable expense. Then you have fixed expenses, which are things like rent and things that don't go up and down with your production. That's a fixed expense. So you have two categories, payroll, fixed and variable expense. The next big category is doctor compensation, right? Yeah. And then the fourth category is profit. So we calculate overhead by adding up the first two buckets, which is payroll and fixed and variable expense. That excludes doctor compensation. Okay. Yeah. So we say that the average overhead in the United States for a dental practice is 68%. That means that the first category and the second category equals 68%. Yeah. The problem is with the money left, you have to still pay the doctor or doctors in that dental practice. And then everything that's left over is the owner's reward for taking the risk. And that's yeah. called profit. In a real business, after right. some period of time, yeah. you should experience a significant level of profit. Right. Most dental practices don't. So at a white belt, most standard level, we're looking at 30% or less going to payroll. Now, of course, there's going to be consultants out there that go 30%, it should be 20%. Yeah. A white belt level practice, 30% or lower would be acceptable for payroll. The next category, fixed and variable expense, 30% or lower is acceptable for that. And then we we say most docs should be making about 30% of the total uh, revenue of the practice. Whatever's left over is profit. So 30, 30, 30, what's left over, that's 90. Yeah. What's left over is 10. So a white belt dental practice in our organization should be 10% profitable. I mean, I love this breakdown. And, you know, this is one of the things and consultants are great and coaches are great, but sometimes they just are not, don't have, aren't in these games in the same way because dental offices are people places, not gluten-free pizza places, Mark. And I want them to go in and tell the assistant they're not getting a raise. I want them to go in. So one of my messages here, and I yours is too, is when you can lower fixed expenses, when you can join a DSN and save money on supplies, these things wind up being some really easy ways, the low hanging fruits to start to work on this as you manage the people part, because the people part is complex, right? The payroll people part is incredibly complex, but getting involved in a buying group, that's literally just getting better prices for ordering the same stuff. Yeah. I mean, we have 1.5 something billion dollars of collective revenue inside DSN. That's amazing. Yeah, so you know that when you add all that up and 1200 off 1200 providers, you know, cl probably closer to, to 20 to, to 1800, maybe 2000 offices represented in there, they look at us like a huge DSL. Yeah. So, you know, the largest suppliers, the largest, uh, the largest equipment people that all of the software companies, they approach us and say, how right. can we participate in your network? All of the biggest, uh, Vendors in I mean, dentistry. I'll just share this. I mean, we're good friends. We work together. We speak. I, I, we're a vendor with Dennis Job Connect because I say, Mark yeah. has all these people. I give them an amazing price, right? A better, best price they can get because I know as a vendor, as someone who's selling something to help Dennis and your community has been great with supporting Dennis Job Connect. And then also, which are like, they should thank you and Addison and Mike for saying, thanks for bringing Dennis Job Connect directly to us on the silver platter right. so that when I need an associate, and that's just one example of a vendor. I know it's self-interested for me, but no, it's also right. like dentists, these groups have curated all this stuff in one spot. I mean, imagine, you know, uh, grocery, I mean, food shopping in the 1900s, you got to like go to 18 different, there's no Whole Foods, right? So you put a Whole Foods in front of these people and said, hey, not only can you buy all this stuff in one place, we've curated it and we've asked the people running this 
to give us the best deal. And also you've done it in such a, I believe, authentic way where people like me want to give the best deal, right? It's not like you've said some weird way caused, uh, like threatened us and said, if you don't give us the best deal, you were going to talk bad about you. You just said, hey, you want to come in this community and do this? And I mean, I myself have used vendors in there. So I just think that's a, a important point. And that to get back to your point, that helps you with your profitability. Oh, indeed. Indeed. There, every little point that you can pick up. Th this is a great, another great point. You're bringing up so many great points, Paul. But, you know, when we're talking about HR, HR, which is one of yeah. the largest expenses, it's a full category, right? 30, 30% yeah. or less, hopefully. Um, and then you're looking at fixing variable expenses. Would you rather like pick up a percentage point in cotton rolls and patient right. napkins and not even composite, but just, just the stuff that's all disposable, right. like gloves, if you could pick up a percentage point or two and then go out and give that back to your team or right. uh, give yourself the ability to go and recruit a better person that might have a little bit higher demand on their hourly wage, you're taking, you're, now, now you're becoming a sophisticated business owner. Right. You're, coming, you're, you're taking things that don't mean as much to you and cutting those down to the bare minimum expense and you're redeploying that into another category, right? So yeah. I can't afford afford a better office manager if I can get my variable expenses from X percent to, you know, negative yeah. 3%. I just picked up 3% of my total gross for, for the month. I'm going to throw that over to the human capital bucket. And now I'm, I'm increasing, you know, the amount of talent and the level of talent that I have in the organization. I, I love this, Mark. You know, we are old enough to say back in our day, like, I always say people like my grandmother would be right. People are lucky to know me. Like I've created dental nachos. I get a deal on something. All people have to do is click and get it. They join the DSN, click and get it. You and I had to go from conference to conference, standing over tables, be like, what's the deal on A2 composite today, right? Like that was like a lot of effort to do that. Yeah, I remember those days. Yeah, wow. so it's, you know, it's, um, as we wrap up here, Mark, there's two things I wanted to ask you about. Um, I want to remind everyone, uh, we are awesome collaborators. The Dental Success Network supports our group as a sponsor. You can text DSN to 215-543-6454 to get the best deal possible. But you guys have a startup class coming up soon. And I do want to just kind of have the last few minutes to share. Uh, startups are like people's dreams, but they can become nightmares. And I believe, you know, remember our, remember, um, our gener like don't do this at home or don't try this at home, right? Because on TV, people were like jumping over barrels and some people would get in their car and say, I should jump over barrels and they hurt themselves. And I believe startups have this. There's tremendous reward, but tremendous risk. What are you guys going to do in this class? Who's going to be there? Who should pay attention to this? Yeah, it's a very, very intimate setting. It's at uh, the Vauxhall facility in Houston, Texas. This is designed for people that are thinking about an expansion, thinking about acquiring a practice or doing a startup from scratch. Even if you're a little bit far along in this journey and you need some tips, um, that's what we're here for. We're gonna teach everybody how to negotiate with vendors. Uh, we're gonna teach everybody how to um, analyze an IT bid or uh, an equipment bid. We're gonna show people how to vet out a designer or an architect and a contractor. Okay. Uh, we're going to we're going to show the basics of negotiating a lease and the pitfalls not to fall into just right there. When I think of the big, huge things, when you're getting into either an acquisition or a startup, I'm talking about like design, construction, yeah. heavy equipment and IT hundreds of thousands of dollars can be uh, of mistakes can be made in a single day. And I've made them all because I wasn't sophisticated enough to walk in there with somebody that knew what they were talking about and had made the mistakes before, yeah. you know, I didn't, I didn't have a coach. I didn't have, you know, uh, somebody that was somebody that was kind of steering me in the right direction. So uh, that's what this is for. That's to educate people so they can do it on their own. And we have tons of resources that we're going to share with people, but, you know, Chris Green, uh, Dr. He's Chris awesome. Green has one of the mo most successful startups that I've ever seen in four year in a four year period of time. He grew by a million dollars every single year since in a very saturated area. He's a great guy too. Super humble. I would love uh, hanging out at uh, Dental Success Summit with him. And I also want to share, Mark, the, you give people the contra. Remember that game cheat code, not only to their success but also their sanity. Because when you acquire a practice, I'm going to talk about that. A lot of this stuff set. 
you're not buying a new cabinet that day. But when you do a startup, there's also just so much time that you have to interact with these vendors. And I don't know, where do you get this time, right? If you're an associate, you're working. So you're giving people not only the cheat code to success, but also to their sanity. Um, because you could, I believe it, it just becomes overwhelming to deal with so many vendors at the same time, all needing your attention and your decisions and money. Uh, if people want to learn more about signing up for this awesome two days, where can they go to do that, Mark? Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, sure. Well, it's uh, March 9th and 10th. The uh, URL is events.practicelaunchpad.com. It'll give you more details, the opportunity to, to sign up. We're giving everybody on the nachos in the nachos audience a $500 off. Oh, I like for that. that. So, um, so just head on over events.practicelaunchpad.com. We'd love to see you there live. There's not going to be any more than 35 people in the room. So it's going to be very, I, I love that. We, you know, we're, we're kindred spirits. We know our people, Dennis love a deal. They love a deal inside of the deal. Uh, they would take a bite wing of the bite wing if they can, Mark. Well, I appreciate all this time and sharing, uh, love what we get to do together to help Dennis. I mean, I kind of want to end with dental Facebook groups are great for awareness. What the DSN does is for action. When you pay for something, you pay attention to it. That's been my quote this year. I want dentists. I'm glad. I'm thrilled what I built with this community, but just kind of hanging around on a free Facebook group is like hanging around the edges of a gym or hanging outside, outside the gym. It's great to be aware. You got to step inside, meet these people. When you pay, you pay attention to stuff. Mark, thanks so much. If people want to join, um, find out more about this, they can reach out to us at dentalnachos.com. They can text DSN to 215-543-6454. And Mark, if people just wanted to pay attention to any great thing that you do from the events to the DSN, what is the best place for them to go to to do that? I'm pretty active on socials. Um, I would go Dr. Mark Costas on Instagram or just go listen to the Dentalpreneur. It'll give you Dental a Dentalpreneur podcast delivery. is great. Yeah, and any opportunity that you want to reach out can probably be done on Instagram. I still link my very first speech about buying a practice at the Dental Success uh, Summit because I've never got so many laughs at the same time because I never spoke in front of 600 people. So that episode 319 on the Dentalpreneur, I, uh, I, I, uh, I listen to it even myself sometimes. So thanks for doing all the great things that you do, Mark. Truly appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Paul.